Good evening and welcome. I am Gimba Umar. Tonight, Justice Sylvester Nguta arraigned at the Federal High Court in Abuja for corruption charges gets a 100 million naira bail in self-recognition. Acting Chief Justice of Nigeria asked judges to key into the anti-corruption drive of the president, seeks elimination of unnecessary delays in the dispensation of justice. The race to the Ondo State Government House heats up as candidates hold debate in Akure, the state capital. And a suicide bomber kills at least 27 people at the Shia Muslim Mosque in the Afghan capital, Kabul. On business news tonight, experts and economic management team react to third quarter GDP data, say the economy is on the right track. And on sports news tonight, elephants of Ivory Coast captain Gervinio ruled out of next year's African Cup of Nations in Gabon after undergoing knee surgery. I'm Gloria Umezioke and from Abuja, governors of the All Progressives Congress gather in Kanu to brainstorm on electoral reforms and constitutional amendment. The judiciary is taking the lead tonight with the arraignment of a serving Supreme Court justice, the first in the history of Nigeria. Justice Sylvester Ngucha pleaded not guilty to the charges of money laundering, corruption, age falsification and judicial misconduct, among others. Our correspondent Amaka Okafo reports that Justice Ngucha had been granted bail on self-recognition and in the sum of 100 million naira. Justice Sylvester Nguta waiting for the commencement of his trial on a 16-count charge filed against him by the federal government following his arrest and detention by the Department of State Services. At the proceedings, Justice Nguta pleaded not guilty to all the 16-count charges brought against him. Having taken his plea, his lawyer, Mr. Kano Agabi, requested for his bail. According to him, the offence for which his client is standing trial is a bailable offence and given his position as a Supreme Court Justice, he should be granted bail on self-recognizance. Rejecting his application, the prosecutor, Mr. Charles Phillips, argued that the defendant cannot be granted bail with respect to his position. He told the court that barely 20 minutes after he was released on administrative bail, Justice Unguta gave instructions to a witness in the case to tamper with evidence to be used in the case against him. He informed the court that in the course of investigation, it was discovered that Justice Unguta maintained multiple identities. He therefore asked the court not to grant bail or in the alternative, grant him bail in the most stringent terms. In his ruling, Justice John Soho said that though the prosecution sought to impress the court on the defendant's unworthiness for bail, it failed to show that the concerns raised did not make it revoke the administrative bail granted to the defendant. He concluded that since there is no evidence before the court that Justice Unguta will not be available for his trial, he will be granted bail. The matter has been taken out of the realm of uh prejudice of uh, slander and all the rumors that you normally hear. It's now in a court of law and we have an opportunity to present our case. We are very, very grateful to the state for that. Well, we opposed the bill because we um, thought that there was a very high likelihood that um, witnesses and the evidence in the case will be interfered with. Um, and that was primarily the basis for the objection. But the, as you know, that has been overtaken by events and um, he's been granted bail in his own recognizance. Even though he has been granted bail on self-recognizance, it is not yet Uhuru for the Supreme Court Justice, whose trial is billed to begin on the 7th of December 2016. Amaka Okafo, Channel Television News. In the meantime, the acting Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Walter Onogan, is urging Nigerian judges to shun all corrupt practices and align with the anti-corruption war of Mr. President. According to Justice Onogan, who was speaking at the 2016 Conference of Nigerian Judges in Abuja, the judiciary is crucial to the effective running and stability of any democratic society. 
He asked the judges to eliminate unnecessary delays and dispense justice as impartial arbiters. This is the 2016 conference of all Nigeria judges of the lower courts. The biennial conference where judges discuss common problems, exchange ideas and experiences, and update skills and knowledge to move in stride with the evolving world of arbitration. It gives me great pleasure. The administrator of the National Judicial Institute, which organizes this conference, says exposure to recent developments in law practice and procedures in courts is vital to equip the lower court judges to judiciously dispense justice at the grassroots. A vast majority of cases come before your, your worships, and quite a number of such cases are concluded in your courts. For the lower courts to serve as veritable instruments for justice and peace in a democratic society, they must continually demonstrate deep foresight for productivity, exceptional capacity, and remarkable courage. Beyond early dispensation of justice and the lower courts, however, the judiciary as a whole has the task to ensure effective running and stability of Nigeria's democracy. And this, the acting Chief Justice of Nigeria says, is achievable only by shunning corruption. As ministers in the temple of justice, we must shun all corrupt practices in order to align ourselves with the anti-corruption strikes of the current administration. We must all, at all times uphold the rule of law, eliminate unnecessary delays, and above all, ensure that justice is dispensed promptly without fear of favor, affection, and or ill will to both parties. The Chief Justice believes that the challenges which hinder the smooth administration of justice and expose the judiciary to criticisms such as inadequate funding and infrastructure, the volume of caseload on judges and delays in criminal trials are all surmountable with renewed effort. Omelogo Nadi, Channel Television News. Nigeria's gross domestic product falls 2.24% in the third quarter of 2016. That's according to latest data from the Statistics Office. Africa's largest economy shrunk by 2.06% in the third quarter as the country is hit by massive shortage of revenue, foreign exchange and a volatile Naira dollar parity. Today's data shows Nigeria's oil sector falls 22.01% in the third quarter and in September, while non-oil sector grew by a paltry 0.03%. Oil sector contribution to GDP was seen at 8.19% and non-oil sector contribution to GDP was higher at 91.81%. During the period under review, Nigeria's aggregate gross domestic product in nominal terms was uh, recorded at 26.558 billion naira or 9.23% growth. Well, joining me on the news at 10 to throw more light on the issue is the Managing Director of Cowrie Assets Management, Mr. Johnson Chuku. I want to thank you so much indeed for coming on the news at 10 at this time. What are your immediate reactions that we've seen just as I just read out there to the latest GDP numbers showing further deepening in the economic recession that we're currently in? Well, I expected that we're going to see a further decline in the GDP um, because um, the structural challenges we have in the economy have not been addressed. Uh, but the good news is that uh, the non oil GDP uh, is beginning to recover. I mean, we saw two quarters of um, non oil GDP decline. For the first time in three quarters, we are seeing a, a, an, an increase, though a marginal increase of 0.03%. But it also gives the government the opportunity to look at the sectors of the economy we need to address. What we need to address is basically address the issue of oil, oil production. If you look at the challenge we have oil production, we had a decline in oil production to 1.63 million barrels per day compared to 2.17 million barrels per day which we had in the third quarter of last year. So the major challenge we have is that oil sector which accounts for 90 percent of our foreign exchange earnings have declined and that decline is manifesting in the, product, in, in the manufacturing sector and trade sectors. So you also see shrinkages in the manufacturing sector and the trade sector because of the impact of dropping oil, oil production. Is this in any way related to the key driver of the economy being uh, recording contractions such as the ones that we've just seen? 
Yes, you see, if you look at the structure of the Nigerian economy, like the uh, National Bureau of Statistics said, you have to understand, to understand the Nigerian economy, you have to understand the Nigerian economy from the perspective of oil economy and non-oil sector, the oil sector and non-oil sector. The oil sector, which, like I mentioned, accounts for 90 percent of foreign Asian earnings, but only accounts for 8.1 percent of our GDP, shrank by 22 percent in the third quarter of this year. But because the oil sector accounts for 90 percent of our foreign Asian earnings, the impact of drop in oil, oil sector have manifested in several other sectors. The manufacturing sector, the trade sector, and these two sectors, the manufacturing sector accounts for about 9%, 9 to 10% of our GDP. The trade, trade accounts for about 50% of our GDP. Both of them shrank because of lack of effects. So, and if you look at the sector that shrank, they are also manifestations of the drop in crude production. So the government has a job well cut out for it. Mm. And I think that should be, how do we address the issue of a, 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 a attack on oil pipelines? So that we, how do we address the issue of militants in the Niger Delta? Because the greatest challenge we have today is the oil sector production. If we can address that, because we are seeing recoveries in the oil sector, then obviously, if we can actually see a recovery in the oil sector, we should be able to see a recovery in the not too distant future. Now, now uh, you, you've just said, uh, let me just take it out from your, uh, your, your mouth there, uh, in the not too distant future. So what do you forecast for the fourth quarter of the year 2016? Well, uh, based on the uh, available data to us now, uh, I want to believe that the fourth quarter of 2016 should actually still see a decline in GDP. Um, the recovery we saw in the non-oil sector was driven principally by the agriculture sector, which grew by 45 Four percent, and the telecommunication sector. But you also saw that virtually all other sectors, apart from the likes of uh, uh, financial services sector, all declined. So, and the beauty of what you have seen is that we're beginning to manage, see the effect of the interventions in the agricultural sector. And for me, policy, manage, policy leaders in the country should also take a cue from why is the agricultural sector growing? Because agriculture sector is actually enjoying one of the few sectors enjoying funding from the central bank as single digit. So it simply means that if we can actually direct funding to other sectors of the economy at relatively low uh, interest rate, we may be able to begin to see recoveries in other sectors. But unfortunately, that's not what is happening. The intervention we are seeing in the agriculture sector is manifesting in growth of that sector. And the other sectors are deprived of liquidity. And therefore, you are seeing shrinkages. I mean, contractions in those other sectors. So two things the government should take away from this is that we need to address the issue of militancy to improve the level of production in, the, in, in, the, um, in our crude production, and then we also need to find ways of rejecting liquidity to the economy so that we can trigger recoveries in other sectors. Because the only sector that is getting development finance initiative funding with the agriculture sector is beginning to manifest a recovery. Okay, so if, if I may just uh, come in there, what do you consider as the short to medium term imperatives in getting uh, the, the economy back in recovery mode? Well, we have to restore liquidity from two sectors, for, from two segments of liquidity requirement. One is FS liquidity, and second factor is local currency liquidity. So we must find ways of assessing unlending facilities. Um, I have mentioned the issue of improvement of in crude production. But beyond that, in the short term, the government must, just like a country like Egypt has assessed a $12 billion uh, support line from IMF, the Nigeria need to assess on offshore line mm. to support foreign currency liquidity in the economy. Two, we must find ways of injecting local currency liquidity in the economy. That could be by way of reducing the cash reserve ratio, which is currently at 22.5, or also reducing the monetary policy rate. Those we need to do to trigger recoveries. Because unfortunately, the federal government, the fiscal end of the government, uh, the, uh, the government does not have the way we have to inject the to that will lead to recovery. Mr. Uh, Johnson Chiku, of course, the Managing Director of Curry Assets Management. We do sincerely thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on the news at 10 in part two after the break. Presidency promises to make 2017 budget proposal ready by first week of November. Please join us again.